Okay, let's begin. Um, let me begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands upon which we meet uh, and acknowledge their elders, uh, past, present, and emerging. Um, my name is uh, Ju Chong Tam. I'm the director of the Electoral Regulation Research Network. And firstly, really a warm welcome to all of you. Um, I'm particularly delighted to welcome you to this seminar, uh, which has been organized by the Electoral Regulation Research Network, uh, together with the Gilbert and Tobin Center for Public Law and the Melbourne School of Government. Now, it's patently obvious and evident that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, poses novel and complex challenges as to how Australian democracy uh, functions. At one level, uh, there are novel and complex challenges as to the process in which we elect uh, those who govern us, or put it differently, to the conduct of elections. So we saw, for example, uh, in the past sem EARN seminar, which had the Australian Electoral Commissioner Tom Rogers speak together with Paul Erickson, the, the ALP National Secretary, about the changes occurring in terms of the conduct of elections and campaigning, and using the Eden Monero by-election as a case study. And later this year in November, where there'll be a round table where Tom will return uh, together with various other electoral commissioners, including uh, Warwick Gately, the Victorian Electoral Commissioner, to speak of their experiences in terms of conducting elections in this pandemic. So at one level, there are challenges in terms of how we elect officials, but certainly there are also challenges in terms of how elected officials govern. And specifically for this seminar, there are real questions as to how Parliament should operate in terms of its representative function, its accountability function, and its lawmaking function. In this context, a particularly critical question is whether Parliament can and should operate as a virtual, as a virtual legislature. And to address this question, we have two highly distinguished speakers. Um, Senator Scott Ryan, the uh, President of the Senate, who's uh, joining us uh, by phone. Um, and we have Professor Anne Toomey, who's Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Sydney. Now, thank you to both of them for agreeing to speak today. And I would like to personally thank uh, Scott and Anne for their continued support of EARN activities and really their constant willingness to actually participate in our various seminars. Now, in terms of format, uh, Scott will speak for around 50, uh, 25 minutes and then Anne will follow with a commentary about 10 minutes. And the rest of the time, uh, which will be significant, will be devoted to questions and discussion. You can ask your questions through the chat function. Uh, and I can ask you to address your question to everybody so that uh, we have an open and transparent discussion. And then what I'll do is that I'll put the questions uh, to uh, Scott and Anne. And typically how I do it is basically by grouping a number of questions. Now, before I pass on to Scott, uh, let me just note that this event is uh, being uh, recorded uh, and the recording will be posted on the EARN website um, after the event. Without any further ado, let me pass on to uh, Senator Scott Ryan, the uh, President of the Senate. Thanks, Ju Chong. Um, I assume you can hear me well enough? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you very well. Great. Apologies Thanks. for the technical hassles, even with... Um, so thanks for this opportunity. Sorry, Scott, you're, you're fading in and out. Um, I'm going to... Leaning into the phone, is that better? Yeah, that's, that's much okay. better. Yeah. So um, I'm going to try and discuss several issues today. Um, the background to what we had to put in place, a very brief discussion of legal and constitutional issues that has more expertise in. Uh, the practical issues, the operation of it, it's on in the first two weeks we've used it. And what I think are some particular Firstly, sorry, with respect to back Sorry, back Scott, back. I think you're fading in and out again. Uh, sorry, I am yelling into my phone. Um, is this better? Yeah, th this is better, yeah. This is better, yeah. Okay. Um, everyone is familiar with the pandemic in terms of background, but I think we can easily forget how um, quickly it moved in that weekend in mid-March. 
sort of overnight, gatherings were shut down, travel rapidly became quite difficult. Parliament comprises 227 members and senators, several hundred staff flying in, several hundred members of the press gallery and their support staff, plus all those who visit the building for public tours, observing the parliament itself, the school tour program, individual or group meetings with parliamentarians and officials, events ranging from a few dozen to hundreds on an almost daily basis, plus permanent staff, which means on a sitting day, several thousand people are usually in the building. In short, the normal operation of Parliament was not consistent with the COVID world, the rapidly evolving health advice, and in the end, the regulatory and legal requirements imposed by public health orders. So obviously we had to determine means to ensure the essential elements of Parliament were able to operate for simple continuity of business and the core function of accountability, of course, but also there was an express need by all to be able to deal with urgent legislation and put it before Parliament for consideration in order to handle the implications of the pandemic. Initially, uh, we simply closed down non-essential aspects of the building, functions, tours, events, non-essential access for meetings. Importantly, we left the determination of what was an essential meeting in the hands of individual MPs. We did not impose a particular rule on that. Closure of all seated catering, takeaway uh, catering only, essentially the rules many of us were familiar with, um, I might say particularly in Melbourne. But we also knew we had to build a virtual capacity and develop rules and procedures accordingly. In terms of the pre-existing facilities we had, teleconferences had often been used for private committee meetings and some public hearings, particularly in the Senate where committees meet far more often than the House of Representatives. There was indeed one committee room available to each of the House and the Senate for video conference use, and it had been there for a while, but this facility hadn't been used that often. In my view, this was for two reasons, a lack of familiarity with it and inertia, and second, that often people at the other end people who would like to video conference in didn't have the facility at their end to be able to utilise it at this end. <clears throat> this rapidly changed and we undertook an extensive upgrade of our equipment to allow for more virtual committee meetings and what we described as remote attendance at Parliament for reasons I shall explain. We were also in the midst of a system-wide upgrade of network software to allow for internal video conferences via Teams. Uh, I don't have the same technical problems for some reason. That. Uh, but that had not been completed and that all had to be put on hold in order to enable the rapid shift to remote access. Finally, to ensure scrutiny over the long term, but also over the period where Parliament was not going to sit, a Senate Select Committee into the COVID response was established, importantly with the majority of non-government senators. <coughs> this has held regular almost bi-weekly hearings covering all aspects of the impact of the pandemic and the response. While I share the concerns of some who are concerned at the lack of scrutiny at the state level in some areas, the expertise and established role of Senate committees has again been reflected in the successful conduct of this committee. Secondly, a brief summary of the constitutional and legal issues. One key legal issue is that subject only to issues of privilege, Parliament House is bound by ACT law. So the Speaker of the House and I as presiding officers had to ensure we abided by local regulations while not impeding the operation of the Parliament. In this sense, while the building is operated jointly, the two chambers took subtly different approaches, partly based on the fact that the House of Representatives is twice the size of the Senate. First, the informal arrangements allowed for larger numbers of what we refer to as pairs by agreement between the government and the opposition, allowing people to not attend Parliament but still have the numbers on, reflected in votes that were conducted on the floor. This is long-standing practice in the Senate, but it is intermittent in the House. In the House of Representatives, the standing orders were changed to allow for a lower number to agree to amend or suspend them, in essence, to change the rules that the Parliament would operate by. But this could only be done by agreement between the government and the opposition. We didn't do this in the Senate, as it was not deemed necessary due to the different composition of the Senate with minor parties and independents, and no one having a majority, and the rules we already have in place, which are different to the House. Now, in particular, the Australian Capital Territory had limits on numbers gathering in a single space, which were at this point at 100. And this posed a challenge for the House of Representatives, given its membership of 151, the regular attendance of the press gallery in the galleries upstairs, as well as staff. And the House determined to abide by this limit, so it had to change its operations slightly. This didn't impact the Senate, primarily to our size, effectively being 76, we were well under it. 
So moving to the so-called virtual parliament, which we have re determined as remote attendance at parliament, we did this to differentiate it from a Zoom type work meeting, which we're all familiar with, with everyone working from their home. These matters were considered by the Senate Committee on Procedure, on which all parties are represented. Whereas in the House of Representatives, it was by negotiation between the Leader of the House and the Manager of Opposition Business. So from a Senate perspective, we needed to ensure we complied with constitutional provisions, particularly Section 125 about Parliament meeting in the seat of government. So in lay terms, we determined that the Senate sits as normal, with a physical quorum present, which is a quarter of the Senate, some senators being permitted to attend the Senate remotely. We're confident that Section 16 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act of 1987 provides for the definition of proceedings in Parliament as, and I'll quote, all words spoken and acts done in the course of or for the purposes of or incidental to the transacting of business of a house or of a committee. As outlined earlier, committees have long conducted business other than being by being physically located together. So we have no doubt that the protection of parliamentary privilege to our... Thirdly, practical issues. Getting hold of this equipment for rapid expansion, I must say, wasn't easy due to a sudden increase in global demand. But we can now operate both chambers comfortably. Later in October, we will be able to operate the House of Representatives plus four Senate committees conducting estimates hearings concurrently with a little bit of backup. Practically, because the chambers operate and sit in Canberra with others attending remotely, it means the Speaker and myself need to be here. It's not practical to chair the Senate or the House by remote uh, procedure. Uh, there are obviously technical issues, and we've had the occasional hiccup, but this has been exceptionally rare. Now, to avoid the technical issues, which we've seen um, with all of us, um, with a little bit earlier today. Uh, we've asked senators and members to participate from their electorate offices or from a Commonwealth office in their home capital. We can effectively oversee the equipment because it's all part of our own network and this has assisted with stability. More than 150 committee hearings have been held as well as two full weeks of parliament and there have only been a literal handful of problems. On almost all occasions, they were usually at the witness end rather than on our network. So a broadband connection or a computer or an iPad. Senators, because of the extensive use of this for committee hearings, were much more familiar with the operation of the system. And so that made it particularly smooth, I might say, in the Now subtly different procedures were put in place in the House and the um, But generally, a person attending remotely had the ability to ask questions or to speak to a matter before the chamber, for example, on legislation. However, they could not vote in the chamber and they could not move a procedural motion. For example, that the next business item be called on or that the speaker no longer be heard. They could not raise points of order. In the Senate, however, we did allow senators to move amendments to bills before the House in the committee stage. This is not something that could be done in the House. It reflected the fact that in the Senate, we often spend a longer period on the committee stage as crossbenchers, independents and opposition all have an extensive opportunity to move amendments to legislation. Also, in the Senate, attendance was as of right, whereas the whips and managers in the House had more control and they put in place certain provisions about on what basis, when and for how long someone could be online. Whereas in the Senate, you effectively could come online as you wished for as long as you liked. So some reflections. Uh, as I said above, um, senators were more familiar with the technology than were members, but we provided extensive training and support to officers and senators and members to ensure it was successful. It was, the objective was that it be available to ensure those who could not attend were able to have their voices heard. There are many reasons people cannot attend, not least of which are the, in my view, sometimes questionable controls put on those from some parts of Australia as to attend Parliament or undertake parliamentary business at home. Be aware that Victorians had to quarantine for two weeks in Canberra before they were allowed out or to attend Parliament. For that reason, I've physically relocated to Canberra for the remainder of the year. Up until last Friday, and still in Tasmania, Senators and members are required to quarantine at home after returning from Canberra. Uh, and that means that they are unable to go to their electorate offices, and so we have to provide a facility for them if they wish to remain at home to attend and participate. 
Some cannot attend due to maybe privately known only health conditions that put them in an at-risk category. And so we had to ensure that there was as much flexibility as possible. There's a general view that it was successful and that it is expected to be re-endorsed for the coming budget week sitting starting next Tuesday. And then I expect it to be endorsed again for the sittings of Parliament in November and December. Now there's been some discussion about whether we should allow remote voting and, and some background to this is worth considering. First, um, this was the first time we'd done this and um, someone could call me conservative, but I think ensuring that we made it work without any problems was important to the credibility of the system and to the parliament. So starting it the way we did with speeches, questions and in the Senate being able to move amendments, people got very familiar with the system and it worked quite well. Second, the extensive pairing system that operates in the Senate effectively ensures votes are counted, even if you are absent. If a senator is absent, a senator from the opposing view on that particular item will be excused from vote voting in order to reflect the absence of the other senator, but both will be recorded as such in Hansard. Importantly in the Senate, this also applies for minor party senators and independents. So if a member of, for example, the Greens party was voting with the Labor party but could not be in Parliament, um, they would be paired with a member of the government to ensure that the votes in the Senate reflect the numbers in the Senate, even if not everyone can be here. This is long-standing practice in the Senate that, to my knowledge, has not been challenged or withdrawn in living memory, despite it being less stable in the House. Indeed, in the hung Parliament that was hotly contested from 2010, there was no pairing for much of that time in the House of Representatives and pressure was brought upon the Senate to abolish this informal understanding between parties. But this was repudiated firmly and without question and the pairing remained in the Senate. Third, we need to meet the constitutional test of section 23 that all senators are entitled to vote on every question. This requires that any system to allow remote voting must be stable enough to ensure all senators attending remotely are able to vote at the, any time that they need to. Finally, regarding voting, there is the real question of ensuring a vote is being exercised freely and without coercion or improper, uh, improper influence. A final reflection I would make on these matters is that there is actually some virtue to assembling as a parliament. The remote attendance option was initially designed as a break glass in case of emergency procedure. It has since become a way to augment the operation of Parliament. It's not there to replace it. There would be a massive loss if we went to Zoom style Parliaments with all of us coming from our lounge rooms Melbourne style. And I might say that the people who would like Parliaments to assemble only in such a disparate fashion may well be the executives of political parties. The presence of members and senators is a key driver of accountability in both government and opposition. That said, I imagine the whips would likely have a different view and hate it. They are responsible for maintaining party discipline and I can think of a few parliamentary colleagues who would enjoy the opportunity to show a little bit less discipline remotely. But there are two more important elements of physically attending that I think gravitate to ensuring physical attendance remains the prime form of parliament. Firstly, we learn from spending time with one another. We share experiences and learn about the lives of others. In a world with smaller and smaller information and social bubbles, Parliament for all its flaws is a place where people from different parts of the country with different experiences come together. Doing so remotely in my view, sorry, doing so solely remotely in my view, would make it easier for people to settle into simple ideological or attitudinal camps. Secondly, there are some forces in our polity that seek to elevate the politics of grievance. They are predominantly people who do not seek government, who often accuse those who do of, quote, selling out when compromise and trade-off is the very essence of politics and government and is critical indeed to the operation of the Senate, a place where no one party usually has a majority. It would not be fruitful in my view to allow such forces to be elected by effectively running against what Parliament does and then to never attend it thereby putting distance between themselves and the body they are elected to, supercharging the potential politics of grievance. We are all senators and members. We all need to own our actions here rather than pretend we are something separate from a party. Finally, um, potential developments. Where could this go? Well, one idea is that I think we could potentially deal with some of our non-controversial legislation 
in this way. Uh, it's often said that a great amount of the legislation that goes through Parliament is dealt with uh, by consensus or essentially by agreement between parties, whether that be by the product of prior negotiation or it being legislation of a primarily technical nature that doesn't provoke political debate. Now, we do this in a period every week where we deal with a handful of bills, usually on a Thursday morning, uh, but there is quite a significant volume of this. There could be a way where we deal with non-controversial legislation with a smaller quorum present by agreement between all the parties in Canberra and allowing participation remotely so that people can put on the record their concerns, their views and indeed even ask questions. Secondly, I think this is going to radically change parliamentary committees. Now, the Senate is the prime legislative workhorse of the parliament in this sense, and Senate committees function in many ways as the core constituency of most senators. It, when I started here a dozen years ago, people would think nothing of jumping on a plane from Melbourne to Sydney for a four-hour committee hearing. It was just part of the job. Um, it posed a particular burden for those from North Queensland, Western Australia, or places outside the triangle of Sydney, Melbourne and Canberra. The use of this technology, the fact that people have become so much more comfortable with it, it having become so much more of day-to-day -day work, will in my view mean that so many more committee hearings are conducted this way. This will have the benefit of potentially allowing a wider number of voices into the Senate committee process, people that otherwise might not have the opportunity to physically attend a committee hearing. But I do think we also need to be careful to ensure that sometimes a committee visiting a certain place may in fact bring about a particular perspective that remote attendance will not. Many years ago, I did a committee, series of committee hearings onto um, native vegetation laws. Uh, for some reason, it came to the Senate Finance Committee. Um, having grown up in suburban Melbourne and with no particular family, family or experiential connection to agriculture, I learnt a lot by physically going to communities and actually hearing from people dealing with this on both sides of the particular debate. But I do think that, particularly for those who have to travel a great deal, uh, this will make a wider number of senators be able to participate in a wider number of committees because it will be easier and not pose the same burden physically or wise. I think over time we may evolve to allow more activity such as voting remotely in specific circumstances. That's purely a personal prediction. It's not a, it's something I can say that the Senate is heading down that path in the near future. But I think I can foresee circumstances such as people being on parental leave or people having a particular need to be away where we may move over several years towards allowing more participation remotely, such as moving motions, points of order, and potentially even voting, uh, but that's not in the present in the foreseeable future. I think I'll leave what I was going to suggest there, Ju Chong, and wait for um, your comments and contribution and any questions or observations people have. Thank you so much, Scott, for really an informative and insightful. I think um, I think all participants, I'm very grateful for um, they may get a glimpse in terms of how the virtual parliament has been assembled in the past few months. Now, let me hand it over to Anne for her commentary. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects of this is the, the, the constitutional stuff. So is it an impediment at all? Um, my view is no, but of course we do probably need to test that in a court to be sure. Um, as um, the President said, section, section 125 of the Constitution is a key one because it says that Parliament has to sit in Canberra, um, or the seat of government, which is now in Canberra. And so there's a question there as to how you ensure that it, that is satisfied if you have virtual sittings. Um, there are a couple of points about that which I think are quite interesting. The first is um, uh, this question of what the High Court might think about that and whether or not um, conducting a sitting which at least comes from the Parliament but is populated by people sitting in remote places, whether that amounts to a sitting of the Parliament or not. So um, I'd just like to read to you um, the beginning of a transcript of the High Court from a case heard um, quite recently, and this is what Chief Justice Kiefel said. She said, the record will show that Justices Keane, Edelman and I are physically present in Brisbane 
and Justices Bell and Gagler in Sydney, and we are sitting through the medium of courtroom number two in Canberra. Now, that's actually quite interesting because I actually don't have any physical person sitting in Canberra, but for the purposes of the legislation that deals with the High Court and the High Court sitting and the High Court rules, they are sitting through the medium of courtroom number two in Canberra. Um, Admittedly, they don't have the same constitutional problems that the Parliament does in this regard. It's only statute, and the statute does allow the High Court to sit out of Canberra, so that's not a problem. But nonetheless, the High Court has constructed itself uh, and is expressly saying at the beginning of hearings that it is operating through and sitting through the medium of a particular courtroom in Canberra. So I think it would be very unlikely for the High Court then to turn around and say, ah, but Commonwealth Parliament, you know, you aren't satisfying the constitution by sitting uh, in the seat of government um, if it's simply because uh, some of your participants are doing it remotely. So long as the actual sitting is being um, initiated and orchestrated through Canberra, I think that's enough. A um, second point to make about that is that um, this issue has actually been challenged in the United States. Uh, so in the US Congress, um, uh, instead of um, virtual voting, uh, they've had a system of proxy voting. And uh, that was challenged uh, in the case of, um, what's it called, McCarthy and Pelosi, I think is the name of it. Uh, and so what's interesting there is they've challenged it on the same basis. So they say that the US Constitution refers to um, sitting, um, attend and presence, and that then implies that you have to actually physically be there and therefore proxy voting doesn't work. That's the argument. Uh, now, at least in its first round, and it's now going off on appeal presumably, but in its first round, um, the case was dismissed uh, on two grounds, which I think would be relevant in Australia. Uh, and the first of um, those is that uh, this is an internal matter for the houses, that the houses have the power to determine uh, their own internal proceedings, including how votes are taken, and um, uh, therefore it's not something that the courts will deal with. Uh, and the second relies on a, a parliamentary privilege um, provision in the US Constitution, which is effectively the same as our Bill of Rights 1688 Article 9 stuff or our Section 16 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act. So um, on that basis, again, they say this can't be questioned in a court outside of Parliament, um, therefore none of the court's business and it's non-justiciable. Uh, my guess is that if anyone challenged um, virtual Parliament participation, including remote voting, uh, I, my guess is that a court would take a similar view, and that is that it's not something for the court to decide, it's not justiciable, it is an internal proceeding of Parliament, and it's a matter for Parliament to decide. So I think those are sort of two interesting things. Uh, the other comment I'd just make is uh, at the very beginning, um, uh, the President referred to the fact that um, the Parliament is subject to ACT laws in relation to things like quarantine. And um, it reminded me of something I actually looked up this morning because I, I was reading the Australia ACT Self-Government Act recently, as you do, and discovered there's a nice little interesting provision in there. And it says, if either House of the Parliament passes a resolution declaring that an enactment, that's one made by the ACT Parliament, um, uh, does not apply to that house, to the members of that house, or in the parliamentary precincts, then the resolution has effect according to its tenor and the enactment does not apply accordingly. Um, so that actually means that either house could pass a resolution that disapplied ACT quarantine laws to the members of the house, if, if it wanted to. Now, there may well be very good reasons why it doesn't want to. It may well be the fact that it does want to protect the health and well-being of members and parliamentary staff, etc., and comply with all of the ACT's rules. But if it did ever get to a point where the ACT laws were regarded as being excessive and unnecessary, even without legislation, obviously the territory's power would allow you to override ACT legislation anyway, but even without that, a house on its own by resolution could disapply the application of that law uh, to members of that house. 
uh, regardless of whether they're in the house or not. So, you know, even you're quarantining outside the house, in the ACT, you could disapply the ACT law. Uh, so um, I think that's another um, interesting aspect of it all. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention short, uh, quickly was proxy voting. Uh, so this is an issue that's um, arisen in the UK. Uh, in the UK, they have had, um, historically, they had proxy voting for a long time. Um, the House of Lords um, finally got rid of proxy voting in 1868. Um, so for a long time before that, they used to use it. And they did use it for when people were unwell uh, and unable to come and even during plague and all those sorts of things. So proxy voting was a thing um, historically. So it's hard then to say that this is something that's inconsistent with our system of um, representative and responsible government because it's been well used in the past. Um, it has been used more recently as well in Australia. So um, an example in the House of Representatives, not in the Senate, but in the House of Reps, uh, they've had proxy voting since 2008 for nursing mothers. But you have to be in the building. It's just there so that you don't have to vote in the chamber. Um, all well and good, but that does actually also mean that this argument that sometimes floated, that unless you are physically voting in the chamber, then your vote doesn't count and it's going to undermine the validity of a law. Well, that's just rubbish and has been, um, given that they've had a system that's allowed that to happen since 2008, you know. So um, not the world's most impressive argument. Uh, so proxy voting is an alternative to um, virtual online voting. Um, in the United Kingdom, in recent pandemic times, what they did was initially introduce um, online voting through an app remotely. Um, and that lasted for a, for a while. I think the House of Lords might still be doing it. Uh, lasted for a short time um, in the House of Commons. Um, the government didn't like it very much. So it then reverted to making everybody come in. And then there were these massive lines for people queuing to vote that went for about a, a kilometre. <laughs> Um, which people didn't much like. Um, and then they, they shifted to allow proxy voting by people who were unable to come, who were ill, um, et cetera. So um, various sorts of ways in which you can deal with these things. All right, I'll stop there so that we can move on to questions. Great, thanks so much, Anne. Fantastic as usual. Uh, we've got a whole slew of questions. Um, so let me put, um, um, like I say, I'll group some of them together and I'll put them both to uh, Scott and Anne. Um, I think the number of questions that really go to the, I mean, what I think cause the president has described is really like a hybrid model, it seems to me, where there's a, uh, there's a, there's a quorum basically in parliament in Canberra and then you've got virtual attendees. And in that hybrid model, there are sort of two tiers in terms of participation uh, in terms of parliament. So there are a number of questions uh, that have been put about the implications uh, of this model, if you like, um, on the dynamics of parliamentary debate. Uh, there's a question going whether, how has it changed in terms of the quality of parliamentary debate? And there's also another question which is related as to whether it's actually affected the representativeness in terms of parliamentary debate. Um, and what I'll throw in there is, of course, we know that, you know, we're very conscious about this being in Victoria, is that uh, there are different, uh, you know, quite severe lockdown rules currently in Victoria. And uh, it would seem to me, uh, I'll surmise that the Victorian MPs are more likely to be virtual attendees than other MPs in the country. Uh, so a set of questions about the impact of this model and the dynamics of parliamentary debate. And I widen it out because, I mean, Scott, you put a um, uh, number of points that are really salient, is that not just to think about the dynamics in terms of parliamentary debate, but also the dynamics of internal party debate. And I suppose, you know, inviting you to perhaps um, uh, share your observations as to this particular model, what impact does that have in terms of internal party debate? So that's interesting. I, I don't think it's had an impact yet on um, parliamentary debate as such, but that observation I made about how we don't want people just participating remotely and never coming together, I think is important. Um, people coming together and, get, and usually spending time with one another is the sort of thing that leads to, in my view, slightly less heated debate, a bit like the world of social media. If everyone spends time in their own bubbles and they don't get to meet other people, then it's easier for it to get a bit out of control. In terms of political parties, um, 
in my experience, having been a minister in this job and a backbencher, um, if, for example, there's a significant debate going on within a political party, um, that will happen more and that will happen more extensively and that will challenge, for example, a leadership decision, whether that be a cabinet or a shadow cabinet decision. It will happen much more by people being physically present. Uh, because w people need to have meetings, that they, they seek support from one another. Um, you know that you might not be the only person holding a view. In my view, that is a very important form of party accountability. And of course, party and caucus accountability is actually one of the more unexplored but key aspects of our parliament, or key practical aspects of how our parliament keeps people accountable, for better or for worse. Uh, because it isn't public, it, it's not explored to the same degree. Um, that said, um, I can also imagine that for people who have a particular view, I've only done it I think twice in my career, my side of politics, you are allowed to cross the floor. Uh, on the Labor Party side, you are not, because you the, the rule of the binding caucus and the pledge. Uh, it is a big step to vote against your own party uh, and I, I would imagine that some people might find it easier or less difficult to do if they were not physically present but that's purely supposition on my part. Right so from what you're saying Scott I mean it kind of runs two ways if you like that the physical presence um, might make for more robust internal party debate and so on but on the other hand you're saying that virtual attendance might mean that people might feel less bound by party discipline. Am I, am I reading you correctly? Well, so I suppose there's, there's two elements of what an MP does in Parliament. I mean, I think you mentioned it at the start, there's making laws, uh, formalising a process, and secondly, or prior to that, there's keeping executives accountable. Uh, I think they're very different functions. I think one is done better in person, um, but I, uh, interestingly, we are going to go through a Senate estimates process, which is probably the, the most prominent accountability function of the executive that we have in Australia and one of the more extensive if you look around the parliamentary world we're going to be doing that remotely um, with a lot of senators attending remotely this COVID committee that has been meeting at least twice a week having hearings with everyone from the head of the department of prime minister and cabinet to the chief health officer has been meeting remotely so in that sense that formal accountability of the executive to a parliamentary committee is done I suppose what I was talking about is that that informal accountability that happens within parties, I think, is very... You do need physical presence for that to be as effective as it can be. But it's purely a guess on my part as to whether people would find it more easy to vote against the party line remotely. Um, I haven't really reflected on it, but I imagine it could be. Uh, but that's only the formal process of making a law, so to speak. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. And... Any observations you want to share? Sorry, just trying to unmute myself. Um, I think that for, for, I obviously couldn't talk on the, the political side. Um, I think on the um, other issue about whether you end up having two tiers of members of parliament, um, I think that in a long term would be problematic. I think probably in the short term, acceptable for emergency purposes to facilitate as much involvement as you can get. So recognising that some people just otherwise can't be involved and therefore to the extent that we can involve them to some extent, that's good. Um, but, you know, not sustainable in the long term because it would be really problematic if certain people were excluded from being able to vote um, and um, fully participate in terms of, you know, moving amendments and participation. And it's particularly difficult for independent members and uh, members of small parties. Um, you know, when, when Scott was talking about the pairing issue, I can see pairing is a useful thing, but really pairing only works if you've got members that are totally bound to their own party. I mean, if you're an independent in the Senate or you're a member of a very small party in the Senate, uh, and you know, you might well be paired with someone to vote on question X, um, but, you know, someone will move an amendment on the floor, um, uh, amending your proposition, and you might want to vote the other way. I mean, how do you change your, your pairing, you know, um, according to what any spontaneous vote that comes up can be? I think that's really difficult. Um, I might 
pass that back over to um, the president and see if he can sort of explain that to me more. But I think the pairing system falls down if you're genuinely making a active decision on every single vote as it happens, because many of them are spontaneous ones that do occur and that you obviously can't plan for in terms of pairing. Um, uh, you, you, you'd be surprised how rare spontaneous votes are. Um, so just to give a, a, a people a sense of background, um, every morning and every evening, there's a meeting of whips and representatives of all parties, independents, crossbenchers in the Senate. And um, it allows people to flag where they might be going the next day if they wish to, they don't have to, uh, but to facilitate the management um, of the legislative program and to facilitate the provision of pairs. So I haven't yet, at least in my few years here, come across a situation where someone has not had sufficient notice to be incorporated as a pair. Um, as a general rule, if a senator can't be present and they express in uh, effectively written form to the other parties what their stated intention is, uh, is on a bill or a vote or a motion of the Senate, uh, that will be reflected in the pairing. It does take a bit longer to count votes in the Senate when you've got, I think at one point we sort of had you know, 20, 26 people not present and you had to incorporate cross benches being on one side of one vote, another side of another vote, but we managed it. Um, so there are processes in place that make sure that people are rarely, if ever, truly surprised by what comes before the Senate. Good. Can I um, move on to the uh, workings of the Senate committees um, and really pick up on Scott's comment that, uh, you know, uh, perhaps thinking about what those are future developments, in fact, you could see this expanding in terms of the working of the committees. And I think the sense I got from your presentation that that would be a good thing in terms of uh, greater inclusiveness. There's a question in the chat, which I suppose points to the flip side of it, whether, you know, in terms of that particular move, whether there are actually, uh, uh, whether in your experience, uh, whether there have been greater barriers in terms of participation um, and effectiveness of committees. So one of the challenges I've always had with Senate committees, and it might just been the committees that I was a member of, um, is that you did always want to try and break out of what I call the, the Canberra Club. And I don't mean that to have a go at the city, but um, you know, if you're doing an inquiry into industrial relations, you know you're going to get, a, a, there's a bunch of people who have got expertise, but also have fairly predictable reactions. The reason I mentioned that, mentioned that native vegetation inquiry I did, which saw me travel through Western New South Wales and up to North Queensland, was that we got out of hearing from just people that had firm views uh, on environmental law in that regard versus agricultural development. We got to see and speak to people who both enforce the law and people who um, own the land. So there's always a trade-off, in my view, between um, expertise, which is important, particularly corporate knowledge, because you'd be surprised how many issues just come back every five or ten years in public policy. Uh, the world's changed, but also regulations might have changed. Um, but you do also want to ensure that you get what I'll call much more practical um, feedback about this is how it works in practice. This is what it means on the ground. This is what a change in a funding model for community organisations means to this particular community organisation in this particular town. Uh, I think the Senate committees, which are working harder than they ever have, the sheer number of hearings and committees that have been held um, basically over the current parliament, uh, actually very good at striking that balance. Um, the challenge, if anything, we have is now being one of probably of overload because there are only a certain number of senators that can go into committees and the committee meetings, are hearings are now happening on some committees so often that I know preparation for them, they simply don't have the same amount of time they might have had 10 years ago. Let, let me move on to some uh, specific, specific questions um, uh, for Scott and so and, and if she wants to chip in. And I'll put two. Um, one, whether there's any doubt that uh, parliamentary privilege applies to what the uh, members of House of Representatives and the Senators say in Parliament in this hybrid model. Um, and the second question is how are proposals for urgency motions being handled? Uh, when at least part of the core of the senators are attending remotely? So 
On the first issue, um, as I mentioned, we are entirely confident that Section 16 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act covers uh, remote attendance at Parliament. Um, there's been no expression of doubt of that by, as far as I'm aware, any senator. Um, we have been meeting by electronic means through um, not being physically in the same place now for years, if you consider teleconferences to be like that. And um, I, I know Anne's done a teleconference once um, uh, at a committee hearing and other senators have done them. So I don't think there's any doubt about that whatsoever. And the words I read out earlier about the Parliamentary Privileges Act, we are quite confident in. I hope I interpreted the question correctly. Uh, with respect to MPIs and urgency motions where one needs a certain number of senators to support a motion being put before the Senate, uh, to be honest, that's done by cooperation. Um, no one has sought to take advantage of the absence of senators uh, for what I'll call a procedural trick in that way um, or a procedural issue. Um, the Senate Everyone understands, at least this is most of my 12 years, everyone understands that on most days, no one's going to have a fixed majority. I mean, there was a majority for the government between July 2005 and until the Howard government lost office in November 2007. But that's the only time there's been a majority um, since 1980. Uh, and as one of my friends who was a minister in the Howard government said, it was a majority on most days, on most occasions, but he could never quite rely on it. Um, on, on, on difficult legislation sometimes. So no one's really, the Senate operates on a degree of understanding that there are certain things like the pairing arrangement, like if senators are absent for health reasons such as what we have now, then people don't really try and take advantage of it. That's been my experience over, this, over the challenges of this year. And any uh, comments you'd like to make? Uh, well, in relation to that, I mean, the, the, the flip side, of course, is that in the House of Reps, it's a bit different. Um, so there, there may be circumstances in which, you know, um, some sides or parties in the House might want to take advantage of different numbers um, and, you know, pairing arrangements have broken down. And, and the obvious reason for that is that the, the House of Reps is where government is formed and can fall. So um, uh, the game is played sort of differently there. Um, yeah, no, that's probably all I'd say on that. Hmm. Well, um, another question really pertains to what you mentioned, Scott, about how I think um, uh, that, you know, members of parliament, senators being Canberra, um, you know, in a way is important, that presence is important in terms of breaking down the areas, you know, tribalism and, and so on and so forth. The question goes to whether, you know, in this pandemic, whether some of these informal aspects are being replicated virtually. Um, well, the informal aspects have sort of always been there. I mean, we all, we all spend a lot of time on the phone. Um, I don't know whether people are, you know, using video conferencing to talk to each other more, but I do think that that point in that discussion, the informal element of discussions, debates, relationships across the parties, uh, relationships across states within a party are actually very important. Um, and uh, I noticed there was a paper referred to in Britain by Lord Norton, who is one of their lords, but who's a political science academic on the importance of informal spaces in the House of Commons. And they're going through a debate on this point at the moment because they are looking at, of course, re rebuilding the, the, the Palace of Westminster. And I was asked when I was over there, what is the, imp the impact of this building uh, compared to the old Parliament House? And I'm not old enough to remember it, but that has been written about quite extensively. So there's nothing that we do formally. Um, for example, we don't even oversee the pairs. The, the pairs are not part of Senate procedure. They are something that is done by understanding across the parties. I'd also say I don't think um, the WHIP's influence here is... Um, it should be overstated. In the end, overwhelmingly, most people who participate in political parties, it's a self-imposed party discipline. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, Labor Party, you sign a pledge, you sign up on that basis. And in the coalition, overwhelmingly, it's self-imposed. I mean, unless you are on the front bench where the rule is you have to live by party discipline or resign your position, um, it's usually something that people do voluntarily. But that, that, that is important. Um, I, 
the other important element is Senate committees. One of the really important ways to build relationships and understanding across the parliament was that travel you did together. I once did a five day committee hearing that went Brisbane, Sydney, Adelaide, Perth, Melbourne. That gave you a lot of time as a new senator to spend time with senators from other parties uh, and build those relationships, which meant that the committee became more productive. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add, I'd agree completely with that. So having been a committee secretary and um, doing that kind of travel as well, um, I think it does build up a, a community in the committee and it leads to, you know, more unanimous support, better cooperation, negotiation, less less um, angst um, in terms of these things. The other thing I'd say is also as a witness before parliamentary committees, I mean, I've given evidence to parliamentary committees quite a lot, over the time. And I have to say, although it's a real pain to go to Canberra to do it, the funny thing is that you actually end up with more effective interaction at the morning tea break than you do during the actual hearing. And so that um, informal interaction, you know, even as a complete outsider, um, uh, it, it is a loss if you just come in and you do it on the phone or if you do it on Zoom or whatever and you do your, your short little bit and you're not getting to chat to people about it over a biscuit and a cup of tea, um, it's only really half the value that it would be if the, mm. there is the physical interaction. And so um, I can see how that would be, you know, multiplied in terms of members themselves um, interacting in um Parliament. So that's why I think um, I can understand completely why many members have very strong feelings about the fact that Parliament needs to physically sit, sit together and we shouldn't have ongoing use of virtual parliaments. Um, and th there needs to be some resistance to that. I think there's a lot of really good point to that. Um, but, you know, the other side of it is if you can't get there because of a pandemic, then we've got to facilitate um, you know, use everything we can to make people be able to participate as much as they can. But we do need to get back to normal when normal hopefully arrives. I think the last question I put to Anne and Scott, and my apologies to those who, um, for whom the questions I haven't been able to put to um, Anne and, and Scott. So the last question really um, draws on research uh, in terms of the UK Parliament's um, adoption of a hybrid model. And if like the upsides of a hybrid model in terms of less booing and jeering, um, uh, apparently more focus on substantive issues and also you know, a, a progressive gender impact, if you like, in terms of more interventions by uh, female parliamentarians. So I suppose the question more for Scott, whether uh, he's actually observed uh, any of the upsides um, in the Australian context. So I saw that on the chat and I was thinking about it. One thing, we need to be careful with remote attendance. And I believe this applies in the Commons. It hasn't applied here yet in the Senate, but there is a difference with the way the House works, is that in terms of making contributions in the Chamber, virtual attendance does give a bit more power to the whips because you are reliant upon the Chair receiving notice of who's coming up next because you can't have everyone jump to their feet on TV. So you try and do it by understanding. Now that understanding like pairing does grant some therefore informal influence to party representatives that they don't have in the same way if everyone's present. Now the Senate, I was just going to Google before you threw to me there, Ju Chong, I should know off the top of my head what the percentage gender balance is in the Senate. It is very good um, in terms of being, I think, relative or closer to parity than the House of Representatives and one of the closer to parity chambers in the country, but I just don't have the numbers at the top of my head. Um, and what I would say is that without, we've only done it for two weeks, so obviously there are some um, cohorts for whom remote attendance will be easier, and that would be, for example, people from Victoria with young children who can't quarantine for two weeks. Um, that, um, will be, I think, helpful. Um, secondly, however, and I don't mean to be too dismissive, but I constantly try and call the chamber to order during question time, which is the most you know, heated part of the day. And there are equal opportunity breaches of our standing orders in Senate question time, I must say. Um, I, haven't, I don't notice a particular gender element to the interjections that I have to call to order or the, or the, or the making of noise. We did have a couple of unfortunate incidents a, a couple of years ago that made the press, which were challenging to handle, but they have not recurred and I don't see them recurring in the near future. Any 
any particular comments you'd like to make here? Um, Scott, and any, any other final comments before we wrap up for, uh, you know, uh, the seminar? Um, the one thing we haven't really discussed is the, um, the validity of restrictions on people getting to Canberra to participate in Parliament. And that's one thing that I've wondered a bit about. Um, it's, it's, you know, in terms of the rules of contempt of Parliament, um, if you impede a Member of Parliament from being able to fulfill their duties by stopping them getting into Parliament. So, if you sort of, you know, prevent them from getting in the gates or whatever, and you know, this is sometimes an issue with people blockading Parliament, etc. Um, yeah, technically, that can be contempt. Uh, so, there are some interesting issues there in terms of what um, states have done in terms of imposing these kinds of restrictions. Now, so far, everybody has accepted them because they've been done for good reasons. Um, but if it got to the point where a jurisdiction was completely unreasonably restricting people from being able to exercise their parliamentary functions, I think, you know, more interesting legal issues might arise. I, I'm still not sure whether there's any constitutional basis you could use or um, how you get around them, but I think that they're, they're, there's a potential there for a significant legal problem if the state were to be imposing laws that impeded people from fulfilling their functions as members of parliament. Um, I, I could add to that, Ju Chong, that I did make a statement to the Senate about that very issue on the 24th of August. Um, it is uh, an issue that has provoked some contention. Various states have imposed uh, post-parliament quarantines and then there is of course the conditional attendance at parliament being imposed on Victorians uh, and the Senate passed a resolution about it um, supported by the government and the opposition on the 3rd of September which people can look up to but that Anne is right there is uh, an, an interesting issue there um, which I think would become more apparent if it was to re if they were to attempt to remain in place for longer than what I might call the initial emergency period, which we are really exiting now with hopefully Victoria turning the corner. Yeah. And I can report that the Senate is equal, 38 men and 38 women. Right. As of September 2019, my staff has just let me know, and I think we'll probably go then to majority women when we swear in Senator Thorpe on the 6th of October. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Thanks so much, Anne, for uh, you know, characteristically sort of um, uh, insightful and forthright presentations. And I think exchange was fantastic. And thank you to the participants and uh, all those who have asked questions. So um, I'll, I'll call the meeting at a, and uh, uh, encourage you to stay in touch in terms of the networks activities and also, of course, of the activities of the Urban Tobin Centre and the Melbourne School of Government. Thank you very much. Thanks.